All right, good morning, everybody. Glad you could join us. And a couple preliminary announcements as usual. Um, I'm live streaming now on Sermon Audio as well as YouTube and Facebook should be live streaming too. Not sure if that's still working. I don't do a lot on Facebook, but supposedly YouTube, Facebook, and Sermon Audio we're live streaming on. Um, I'm trying to shorten these lessons for the sake of uh, online viewing and uh, cram a lot of information into a short amount of time, but uh, Going shorter is not easy, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I am archiving all of this. All of my sermons from now on are being archived onto sermonaudio.com, and I'm slowly putting my older uh, lessons on there as well. Uh, that way, if for some reason I'm ever completely banned off of YouTube, uh, I won't lose all that material, and that will still be available. And then uh, finally, um, I also... For those of you that are interested, I air my Bible studies on Final Fight Bible Radio at 8 o'clock a.m. and 8 o'clock p.m. Pacific Time. And uh, that's every Friday, so if you want more material there, you can tune into Final Fight and get it there, as well as a bunch of other good Bible-believing preaching and teaching and conservative Christian music. So, anyway, this is part three on these lessons of the three great days of prophecy. And we're studying the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, and the day of God. Three phrases that show up in your Bible. And the day of Christ, as we've seen in the last two lessons, has to do with the rapture of the church, the body of Christ, and the judgment seat of Christ, which takes place up in heaven and is for Christians, and is a uh, judgment of their works and what they did for the Lord on the earth. Uh, and, those are, and Christians will be rewarded with gold, silver, precious stones, and uh, all that stuff that you read about in first. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, but I won't go into the details on that because we've covered that already. Uh, the day of the Lord is at the end of the tribulation, before the millennium, and has to do with the second advent of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ literally coming back down onto the earth for the second time since he was here 2,000 years ago roughly. He's going to come down again in the flesh, and that's the second advent. And at that time, he's going to destroy the Antichrist and his armies at the Battle of Armageddon. And he is going to rule and reign, according to the book of Revelation, for 1,000 years, Revelation chapter 20. And then after that, you have uh, this phrase that shows up in the Bible only twice. It's called the Day of God. And uh, maybe somebody could argue that this event, this day at the end of the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ should be called something else. Uh, but really, the best term that we have for it is the Day of God in the Bible. So we'll just run with it. Uh, the day of God. Okay, And this is when the uh, essentially the, the universe, the created universe that God has created is destroyed. Uh, the heavens and the earth flee from before his face. And the Bible says there's a great white throne, the books are open, and the dead are judged out of uh, those books according to their works and all that stuff. And then after that, Revelation chapter 21 and 22, you have God creating a new heaven and a new earth. And you read about that at the end of your Bible. So the first lesson uh, that I did on these three days was meant to show you the differences between the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, and the day of God, so that you could rightly divide between the three and be able to distinguish the three when you're reading your Bible. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15 that you need to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. You don't want to get these things all crammed together if they're not meant to be the same thing. All right. And then the second lesson that I did last week was meant to show you the similarities between these three events so that you can start to see a pattern that God is developing here. And essentially, I won't go over all this again, but I wrote it down what we went over primarily last week. Uh, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, day of God, all three of those things, there's a pattern here where there's, there's similarities between each. So, uh, for example, the day of Christ, there's an appearance of Jesus Christ, but it's a, specifically to the church. The day of the Lord, there's an appearance of Jesus Christ, but it's to the whole world. The Bible says, every eye shall see him. All right, And then there's an appearance of uh, God to the universe. And the heavens and the earth flee before his face. And then you have, you know, a great noise on the day of Christ as a trumpet, specifically. You have a great noise at the day of the Lord, uh, his coming and uh, with power and wrath and explosions. And then a, a great noise at the end where the heavens and the earth flee away. You might uh, say that the Big Bang is not at the beginning. The Big Bang is at the end, <laughs> all right, according to the, as far as the Bible is concerned. So as you can see, there's similarities between these days. And if you're wondering about some of these things, uh, go back and watch the last lesson, and you'll see how, how all these things are laid out in detail. So what I'm going to get to today is essentially there's a repeating 
pattern here, and when you start to notice the pattern, uh, what can happen is as you study your Bible, there might be something that's fairly clear about the day of the Lord and clear about the day of God, but we don't have any information of the day of Christ on that particular thing. And so what you can do now that you start seeing a pattern, you can start filling in the gaps and uh, maybe start being able to come to some uh, possible speculations or some educated guesses about some things that are not necessarily spelled out in the Bible. Now, let me point something out here real quick. If you'll turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, right after the book of Proverbs in your Bible, you'll notice that the, the, uh, the, concept, <clears throat> the concept of God doing things in patterns is throughout the Bible. Um, I'm going to get into a little bit more speculation today. This is kind of the finale of this particular <coughs> series of lessons. But uh, I'm not just kind of I'm not just grasping at straws. I'm not just grabbing things out of thin air. The fact of the matter is, God does things in patterns throughout the Bible, and so we can be uh, maybe fairly certain, or even uh, have have a pretty good idea of some things that are going to happen based on the pattern that God has created. Seeing as God has done things in a pattern already, it stands to reason that he's going to continue to do things in a pattern. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9, the Bible says, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. And so it's really interesting, as you study your Bible, what you'll find out is there are so many similarities between the day of the Lord at the start of the millennium and the day of God at the end of the millennium that it's almost easy to confuse the two together. Uh, there's a lot of similarities that are very, very similar, especially when you read Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 20. And you read about the Ancient of Days and the books are open and a fiery stream and he's sitting on his throne. That sounds like Revelation chapter 20, but it's not. Those are two different events, but they sound very similar. Why? Because the thing which hath been is that which shall be. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. God does things in patterns. All right. So, uh, this week, like I said, we're going to look at some of the holes in the pattern and see if we can't make some educated guesses as to some of the prophetic details that are not exactly spelled out in the Bible. And like I said, there's going to be a little bit of speculation today, but the purpose of this lesson is to give you something to think about and to challenge your thinking a little bit. And uh, like I said, at the very least, at the end of this lesson, you're going to have uh, some things to chew on. Now, let's just put it that way. All right, so let's get started. All right, now, the day of God over here is associated with a battle, and uh, we'll call it a world war, because the Bible calls this war. We don't really have a title for it other than the battle of Gog and Magog. Okay, that's what the Bible describes it as in Ezekiel chapter 38 and also Revelation chapter 20. There's a world war where essentially what's happening is uh, after the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, we're not getting a whole lot of information, but we are told that Satan is loosed from the bottomless pit that he's been locked up in for a thousand years. He's loosed from the bottomless pit. He goes forth to the kings of the earth and he deceives them, the Bible says, and uh, basically millions of rebels surround Jerusalem where Jesus is and his people are, and they surround Jerusalem, and fire comes down from God out of heaven, destroys the en their enemies, and then that, that time the heaven and the earth are burned up. All right, and then God, then the great white throne and all that. Now, real quick, bear in mind that the, you say, wow, there's going to be a, a, a bunch of people rebelling against King Jesus. Yeah, the Bible says in Revelation 20, it's going to be as meant the multitude of people that are going to rebel against Jesus are going to be as the sand of the sea. Now, as a Christian, you might be thinking, oh, wow, I hope I'm not one of those people that rebel against Jesus. You don't have to worry about that. You've already been got, given a new body back here that's sinless, okay? So you have to remember that time continues after the end of the tribulation. And throughout the tribulation, there are going to be some survivors, right? Just like when the rapture happens, there are going to be a bunch of unsaved people left behind. And they're going to go through this time period of the beginning of sorrows and great tribulation, and they're going to see Jesus Christ come back, and they're going to be survivors that live into the millennium, okay? Now, these regular people are going to be able to have children, okay? In the millennium, people are still going to have children, just like now, except also bear in mind that those children, they're not born saved, Children born in the millennium are not born saved any more than you and I are born saved. They still have to yield and submit to King Jesus. But there's going to be a lot of people that are not going to like how Jesus has made the world great again. 
uh, not that it's ever really been great. Well, I guess you could say in Genesis chapter 1 through 3, the world was great. Well, Jesus is going to make the world great again. And there's going to be a lot of people that aren't going to like that. And uh, by the end of this thing, there's going to be enough people that are going to rebel against King Jesus and uh, attack him. And you say, oh, I don't know about that. Well, turn to Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. I know it sounds crazy. You would think with Jesus ruling and reigning on the earth and bringing peace and prosperity to the whole planet, uh, mankind would be grateful. <laughs> and they don't even have Satan around to tempt them at that time. Uh, it's basically just to show you just how big of a failure mankind is and how sinful and wicked the heart of man is. They don't even need the devil to rebel against Jesus. They can have the best of situations and they'll still reject Jesus Christ, all right? Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 10, if you don't believe me. The Bible says, Let favor be showed to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he will deal unjustly, and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Well, when is that taking place? I mean, if you're going to take that verse literally, the only time that verse will fit is in the millennium. In the land of uprightness, they will not behold the majesty of the Lord, the wicked. There's going to be wicked people at this time. There's going to be children that are going to be born, and they're going to, be, they're going to have that free will to be able to either choose to accept their king, Jesus, or choose to reject him. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to reject him. All right, look at uh, verse 11. It says, Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see. They choose not to. They refuse to see. But they shall see, the verse goes on to say, and be ashamed for their envy at the people. Yea, the fire of thine enemies shall devour them. Day of God. That fits with Revelation chapter 20, which is what we read. They see the Lord. They know the majesty of God, but they choose not to behold the Lord. And so at the end, the fire of thine enemies shall devour them. And that's exactly what the Bible says. So that verse matches, okay? So we have a world war uh, at the day of God, Satan and the nations versus King Jesus, all right? And that's actually the second time that that happens. As the Bible said there in Ecclesiastes 1.9, the thing that hath been is that which shall be. Because back here at the day of the Lord, there was also a world war, except at that time, the world war was the Antichrist and his armies gathered against Jerusalem. And this is taking place at the end of the tribulation. Okay, The Antichrist and his armies are gathered against Jerusalem. Jerusalem is about to be destroyed and the Jews are about to be wiped out. And then the Bible says Jesus Christ is going to appear from heaven with his armies to fight the Antichrist. And the Antichrist and his armies are burned up at the second advent and destroyed by Jesus Christ. Now this battle is called the Battle of Armageddon in your Bibles. Okay, Armageddon is not some meteor that falls from the sky and threatens the planet. Armageddon is a world war of Jesus Christ and his armies versus the Antichrist and his armies, according to Revelation chapter 16. All right, so there's a world war at the day of the Lord. So you notice the pattern. <laughs> I think you see where I'm going with this. World war, world war. So maybe it can't, it makes you wonder if there could be. Maybe. Like I said, this is just speculation. But we're looking at patterns. So if we've got a hole here, I wonder if there's going to be a world war in proximity to the day of Christ. The rapture. The pattern doesn't prove this, okay? But, there is, but the pattern does give us an indication of this, okay? And the question is, would the world war happen before the rapture? Or would the world war happen at the time of the rapture, or would the world war happen after the rapture? Or is there even any indication in the Bible that there's even going to be a world war around this time of the day of Christ? Well, actually, yes, there is, believe it or not. Now, I'd like to do an entire lesson on this subject sometime, and I probably will soon, but I can only hit some highlights for today. But 
We do know from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the church's, de the church's departure will be around the time that the man of sin is, uh, arrives or is revealed, and the church will recognize the man of sin before the rapture occurs. We have that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's the very last thing that has to happen before the church can be taken out. And then we hear the trumpet sound, and we go out, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. All right. When, when John, who's a type of the church, the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, when he hears the trumpet sound in Revelation chapter 4 that says, Come up hither, okay, he was in heaven immediately, and the first thing that he sees when he's up in heaven, and then God's going to show him the revelation of the things going on down on the earth, the very first thing that he sees is a white horse rider. So we have a type of John being taken up into heaven. He hears a sound of a trumpet that says, come up here. Immediately he's in the spirit, he's up in heaven. And then he sees the throne and he talks about some of the things he sees in heaven. But the very first thing he sees when he looks down on the earth is Revelation chapter six, behold a white horse, All right? He sees a white horse and that right horse, according to Revelation chapter six, goes forth conquering and to conquer. All right? So this white horse rider, uh, it's another study for another time, but he's connected with the man of sin, the Antichrist. And he's a, evidently, he's given a, king, uh, a crown and he's given a bow. And evidently, he's an aggressive king, an aggressive world leader who goes forth uh, conquering. And the word conquering speaks of warfare. Right? So his militaristic movements will evidently antagonize the world or maybe destabilize the world or some kind of uh, conflict evidently happens with this white horse rider. Okay? And uh, what happens after that is he's followed by a red horse, according to Revelation chapter 6. And if you look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 4, look at what the Bible says. Now, what we're looking for is we're looking for a world war in proximity to the day of Christ. Okay? I'm not saying that it necessarily has to happen the day of the rapture, but we're looking at this pattern. So we're just kind of seeing, is there any world war around this time? Revelation chapter 6, verse 4, And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. Not from one or two nations. Take peace from the earth. All right? So it implies a world war, and it says, And that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. All right, so this amounts to global instability. This amounts to global fighting. Revelation chapter 6, verse 4 describes a world war. All right, but, it, but uh, the thing about this one, <clears throat> the thing about this war in Revelation chapter 6, verse 4, is this takes place after the rapture. Absolutely. All right, so. Uh, maybe it's right after the rapture. Maybe it's a couple years after the rapture. But uh, we do know that there's at least a world war right there. And as Christians, we don't have to worry about that. However, there is one more thing I want to point out. There is also a gigantic war described in Daniel chapter 7. And it's allegorized as the four winds of heaven striving upon the great sea. Now, the Great Sea in the Bible is the Mediterranean Sea, so it might not necessarily be a world war, but the four winds of heaven implies the nations of the earth fighting in that Mediterranean area. And I call that battle the War of the Winds. All right, So you have the Battle of Gog and Magog, uh, the Battle of Armageddon, and this war, we know that there's a war right here, but I th it appears, according to the book of Daniel chapter 7, that there's a war almost right at the time of the rapture. The war of the winds. And like I said, I want to do an in-depth lesson on this sometime, and I'm working on another book, The Time of the End, book two, and I have a whole chapter on the war of the winds that I'm going to get into, but for now I'll just have to mention it and basically move on. But essentially what you have is you have, uh, if this war of the winds is a world war, there's another war with the red horse, so you'd have a World War Three. World War IV, World War V, World War VI, according to the Bible. And there could even be another world war between now and the rapture. I'm not even ruling that out. I mean, if we're, let's say, right here, 2022, there could be another world war right here. There's no, nothing to say that there can't be. That would give you a total of seven world wars. Interestingly enough, Back in October, I was hearing talk about a war with Russia. Back in October 
of 2021, I was listening to some of these world leaders and they were talking about war with Russia in late January or mid-February, almost as though they had it on a calendar and it was pre-planned. Because what's interesting is now you can't even turn on your local news without hearing about potential war with Russia. Now, I hope that that's not going to happen, and I hope that it's uh, just fear-mongering and rumors, but, uh, you know, I do know that the world needs a convenient excuse to divert everyone's attention away from the truth coming out about this worthless, pointless thing that has hurt very many people. So, uh, you know, the powers that be might need to divert everyone's attention, maybe with a world war or something. I hope not. Anyway, there could be a war between now and the rapture, and it's always a possibility. And if there was, you'd have World War III, World War IV, the War of the Winds, World War V, the Red Horse, World War VI, the Battle of Armageddon, World War VII, Gog and Magog. The number seven would put a nice little biblical bow on it. I hope that's not the case, though. Anyway, uh, World War II was certainly not the war to end all wars. There's at least three world wars after it, probably four. All right, so another peculiar thing that shows up is uh, the day of God is followed by a new heaven and a new earth. New heaven, new earth, Revelation chapter 20, 21 and 22. So what we have here, what follows is a new world, you might say, in the new heaven and the new earth. The, the day of God is followed by a new world in a very literal sense. Now, the day of the Lord is followed by the millennium, which in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5, is called, quote, the world to come. Not necessarily a brand new planet, because this planet's been destroyed and God makes a new one. No, it's the world to come. It's, it's a completely different world from what we've been living in up until that point. It's called the world to come. It's the same earth, but a different world, if you will, because the nations of the world have been ruled by the, given to the God of this world, according to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the God of the wor this world is Satan. He's run the nations up until this point, and then we have a new world after that, according to Hebrews chapter 2, verse what did I say? Five? Yeah. Now, in 2 Peter chapter 2 also, consider this, in the context of Noah, it says that God spared not the old world, in the context of Noah, implying that the post-flood world, after God flooded the world, it was a new world. Not a new planet. The planet Earth was still there, still intact. But you have the old world before the flood, and the new world after the flood because the world was drastically different before and after the flood. Very simple. Now, before the flood, the earth was corrupt, right? And God sent a destruction, right? Genesis chapter 6 and 7. And he destroyed the old world and thereby ushered in a new world, right? You say, well, what does the flood of Noah have to do with the second advent? Well, Jesus Christ in Matthew 24 likens his coming to the flood of Noah. And before the second advent, the earth is corrupt, right? The last days, the earth is corrupt and wicked. So God sends a destruction, second advent. And God destroys the old world, the kingdom of the Antichrist, and thereby ushers in a new world with Jesus as king. Okay, You see how that pattern of the flood of Noah and the second advent also matches? So the day of God is followed by a new world. Let's just, let's just call it a new world order, how about? I don't think that's a stretch to say a new heavens and a new earth is a new world order. And uh, the um, tribulation and the second advent of Jesus Christ when he comes back and sits on the throne in Jerusalem, you might even say, we, it wouldn't be a stretch to say that Jesus Christ sets up a new world order for 1,000 years. A new world order. So judging by this pattern, I can't help but wonder if the day of Christ, the rapture, will be followed by a new world order. Huh. That's interesting. You might, we might even just say, let, let's, just, let's just say 
that this new world order, I mean, I mean, God is going to destroy the heavens and the earth, right? And then he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, the Bible says. You know, if we were to slap a name on that, maybe we'd just call that something like this. The Great Reset. Hmm. I mean, that's certainly going to be a great reset. He's going to reset the entire, the entire universe. The Great Reset. Well, you know, Jesus Christ at the second advent, he's going to do something similar too. He's also going to do a great reset. He's going to destroy that entire image of, of Satan's kingdom that you read about in Daniel chapter 2 and destroy that all the nations of the world, the, the satanic global empire that's existed since Babylon. He's going to destroy that thing and he's going to have a mountain. That's, uh, the Bible says his kingdom is likened to a mountain that shall never be removed. I think Great Reset is a fair term for the Second Advent, a fair, a fair, a fair title to say, at least something that describes what's going to happen pretty well, because it is going to be great, and it is going to be a reset. All right. So it's not outside the realm of possibility that around the day of Christ, around the time of the Rapture, the world could see a great reset. Oh. Where have I heard that before? That was conspiracy 12 months ago, according to the news media. <laughs> it's not anymore, right? Hmm. So, inter interestingly enough, interestingly enough, let's use a different color here so we don't get all these colors too mixed up. The great reset of the day of God, if you will. Like I said, I'm speaking a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but you know what I'm trying to say. The great reset of the day of God, you know what follows that? You know what follows the great reset of the day of God? Great prosperity. No doubt. It's like uh, the Garden of Eden, except without Satan, without the serpent, without the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You have the tree of life, but no tree of knowledge of good and evil at that time. It's great prosperity. No doubt. You know what follows the uh, great reset of the second advent in the millennium? Great Prosperity. Hmm. Interesting. The millennium. I mean, you read about the millennium all through the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. I mean, it's great prosperity. The prosperity along the line. The Bible says that that desert over there in the middle of e Middle East is going to blossom like a rose. He said the places that bear thorns and thistles are going to be bearing fir trees and box trees and pine trees. You know, you think you have trouble with weeds in your garden. Those things are going to be growing up like trees, as if not be weeds. They'll be uh, fruit-bearing plants. The Bible, it's going to be amazing. There's going to be great prosperity at that time. So, perhaps, a great reset in proximity to the day of Christ could also result, maybe, in great prosperity. Now, you see where I'm getting this from. Say, well, do you have a chapter and verse to prove that? Well, I, I have some things that are interesting, but I don't have time to get into it this morning. But what I'm looking at primarily is an established pattern. Because the thing which hath been is that which shall be, is Ecclesiastes 1.9. The thing that hath been is that which shall be. It's a repeating pattern. We know this. We know this. These are, these are firmly established. These are obvious. So, maybe we can fill in some holes here and see what's going to happen here in the very near future. So, perhaps a great reset in proximity to the day of Christ could result in prosper great prosperity, possibly in the last days of the church age. I think so, according to Revelation chapter 3. Uh, it looks like the church worldwide, not just in America, but the entire church is rich and increased with goods and has need of nothing, including the Lord. And that's a time of great apostasy, which we know has to happen before the church is raptured. So it looks to me like there's going to be a time of great prosperity right before the rapture. There's certainly going to be great prosperity in the first few years of the beginning of sorrows. Because the Jews aren't listening to the preaching. Why? Because they're preoccupied with their merchandise and they're preoccupied with their with their businesses and with their money and everything. So it seems like there's a lot of prosperity around this time, as far as prophecy is concerned. And uh, 
I want to just point something out real quick. I'm not suggesting at all that uh, Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum's Great Reset is a good idea. It's not. But the Great Reset that has been presented to the public and the actual Great Reset that the globalists might have in mind could be two completely separate things. And this is just something to kind of chew on in the back of your mind. But there is an interesting theory that the public right now is being presented with a horrific dystopia of the Great Reset. You know, the average person that hears about that thinks, oh man, that sounds horrible. They're going to eliminate carbon. They're going to have uh, carbon passports. They're going to have these other... These passports is going to be like Australia, except worldwide. That sounds horrible. And so, they, but it could be that the globalists could be trying to scare the world with this image, this presentation, and deliberately trying to manipulate the masses to a different outcome that they had planned all along. The Great Awakening, Great Reset. The, global, the world might be intending for a Great Awakening of Great Global Prosperity. It's an interesting theory. Now, that might not be true, but it's an interesting theory that's worth thinking about, and I'll say a little bit more about that in an upcoming lesson, because that, that is an interesting theory. But another factor to consider here is, is this. The great prosperity of the great reset of the new world order of the day of God is preceded by what? A world war. World war, and then you have that. The great prosperity of the millennium, of the, of the great reset, of the new world order of the millennium, of the day of the Lord, all of this is preceded by what? A world war. The battle of Armageddon. And then these things come in. So, if we're going to have great prosperity right before the rapture, to where the world is, the church is rich and increased with goods and has need of nothing, which doesn't really describe the church at this time, <laughs> during these lockdowns and everything else. If we're going to see great prosperity before the rapture, if we're going to see the great prosperity of the great reset of the new world order, then it stands to reason that there could be a world war before we see all of that. And if there was, I would speculate it would be right here in the near future. The church would be here to see that. And then we would get in on the first portion of the Great Reset, New World Order, Great Prosperity. Again, it's not a good thing. It's going to result in the apostasy of the church. I'm not saying that this is something to necessarily look forward to. This is going to be a trick of the devil, essentially. That's going to put the church to sleep. All right, And then you're going to have that great prosperity, and then things are going to go downhill quick once you get into the end times. So, that would be World War III. And then the War of the Winds, Daniel chapter 7, verse 2, World War IV. And then the Red Horse, World War V, World War VI, World War VII. I, <laughs> good morning, everyone. We, have a, we might have a world war to look forward to. I don't like everything that's happening with this stuff in Russia. We have no business being over there. We have no business getting involved in that. And this whole thing is just ridiculous. And it's escalating pretty quickly. And I hope that what we're seeing right now is not this but I can't help but wonder. So, praise the Lord. In everything, give thanks, and giving thanks for all things, the Bible says. So, thank God. Praise God. It just means that we're, uh, we're almost out of here. Thank God. All right, one more thing. Okay, there's one more thing I want to show you, and it goes way out on a limb. If you think we haven't gone out on a limb yet, well, we're going even farther out on a limb, but there might be something to it, okay? So I'm going to show you this last thing, and I'm going to let you think about it, okay? So we know for certain that the day of the Lord is, thou is followed by a thousand years, okay? We know that from uh, Revela uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. One thousand years is what follows the day of the Lord. Now, I know... <laughs> that the day of Christ, the rapture, is followed by 10 years, 10 and a half to be specific, but 10 years, and then you get to the day of the Lord, the second advent. Now, a lot of people are under the impression that this, this end time is seven years, 
they think from the rapture to the second advent is seven years, and you have three and a half, and three and a half, and that equals seven because of Daniel chapter 9. Uh, I am firmly convinced by the Bible that that is not true, that that is incorrect, that there's a mistake in that logic and that thinking and that interpretation of Daniel chapter 9. And again, I put all of that in print. I've published all of that. I've explained all of that. And I believe proved all of that in the book I wrote, The Time of the End. Okay, you can get that on FinalFiveBibleRadio.com. But I am firmly convinced by the Bible that the beginning of sorrows is seven years and the Great Tribulation is three and a half years. All right. So that would give you 10 years, 10 and a half years to be exact, from spring rapture to a fall second advent, 10 years. Okay. So, day of Christ followed by 10 years, the day of the Lord followed by 1,000 years. You say, what does that have to do with anything? Well, what we're dealing with is a, I'll just uh, say, a factor of what? 100 times 100. 10 times 100. Okay, equals a thousand. You say, oh well, that's really interesting. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's a factor of a hundred. And uh, even if you let me let me just say this, even if you don't believe in a ten-year end times, if you think it's seven years or three and a half years or whatever you want to believe, just just humor me, humor me for a few minutes. Okay, just just humor me. All right. So there's a factor of a hundred. Ten times a hundred equals a thousand. Okay. If I was going to guess about the length of time that follows the day of God, I would find that number based on our pattern by timesing by a factor of 100. Now, don't tune me out just yet. I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Uh, I would, I would suggest that if there was a time frame connected with the day of God, it would be 100,000 years. Right? Because we're dealing with factors of 100 going with our pattern. Now, the day of God has to do with the new heaven and the new earth, which is eternity. So you're probably thinking 100,000 years, that's ridiculous. That's immaterial. When you're dealing with eternity, there is no time. So what's the point about that? And, and you are right, and I'm not suggesting at all that the new heaven and the new earth will only last for 100,000 years and then come to an end. I'm not suggesting that at all. The new heaven and the new earth is eternity, and it goes on forever. Okay, <clears throat> okay. Nevertheless, there is a verse in Scripture that at least seems to indicate a measurement associated in the context of eternity. It seems to indicate a measurement in the context of eternity. Turn to Psalms chapter 105. Okay, Psalms chapter 105. Now, like I said, I'm, I'm speculating on a few things here, but I'm not just grabbing things out of thin air. I'm taking some verses in Scripture that, you know, everybody's kind of wondered about. Nobody has a really good answer for. And I'm not saying that I have the answer either, but there's some peculiar verses in this book that are worth thinking about. All right, Psalms chapter 105, and if you look at verse 4, the Bible says, Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face forevermore. Remember His marvelous works that He hath done, His wonders and the judgments of His mouth. O ye seed of Abraham His servant, ye children of Jacob His chosen, He is the Lord our God, His judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered His covenant forever, the word which he commanded to, now look at this right here, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. All right, now, admittedly, that thousand generations thing is kind of strange. Now, when you talk to Bible teachers, you know, there's a lot of debate as to what exactly a generation is, as far as the Bible goes, uh, how long a, genera a biblical generation is in terms of years. Now, some people say, well, a generation is 30 years. Some would say a generation is 40 years. Some would say a generation is 70 years. Okay? There's all these speculations as to what a generation is because the term shows up multiple times in the Bible in different prophetic contexts. Nevertheless, even if you went with the smallest number, let's just say a generation was 30 years. 
in the Bible. You can make an argument for that. Okay, well, even if you went with that smallest number, a thousand generations, 30 years, 30 years, 30 years, a thousand times, that would be 30,000 years. God said that he would remember his covenant uh, with the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. If a generation was 30 years, he'd be saying that I'll remember my covenant for 30,000 years. Now that's interesting, because that would put you out into eternity. Because he made his covenant with Abraham around 1800 B.C., okay? And then you add 30,000 years to that, all right? 1800 B.C., up to the birth of Christ, that's 1800 years. Uh, from Christ to now, another 2,000 years roughly, that's, what, 3,800 years? All right? And then you have a, a 10 years and then 1,000 years, that's 4,800 years. You know, by the time you get here, you, the world's only been around for 7,000 years, not, not millions of billions of years, but 7,000 years. And you still have another 23,000 years before you get to that point that God has talked about in Psalms 105. Psalms 105. A thousand generations. What is that? What does that even mean? That would put you out in eternity. Now, uh, if we take that verse completely literally then the thousandth generation would be sometime way out in the new heaven, in the new earth, and it begs the question, what happens when we reach the thousandth generation? What happens when we get to that point? Does everything blow up? Does everything cease to exist? Does everything get absorbed into the Godhead? <laughs> no. <laughs> And there's no indication of that whatsoever. And by the way, 1 Corinthians 15, 28 is not talking about everything in the universe getting absorbed into God. I know that's a theory, but it's wrong. That's not what that verse is talking about. There is another much more simple and biblical and biblically consistent answer for, the, for 1 Corinthians 15, 28. That is not talking about the entire universe disappearing and getting absorbed into God and then all that's left is... God himself again. All right? Get ready for this nugget of wisdom. Eternity is eternal. I know. It's very deep. I know. I just blew your mind there. Eternity is eternal. And it's my opinion, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but it's my opinion that Psalms 105, verse 8, this thing about the thousand generations, is more along the lines of a figure of speech and is not necessarily meant to be taken literally. Now, hang on there. I know some of you might just be freaking out right now, but just, just bear, bear with me for just a moment. The Bible uses figure of speeches uh, a lot of times. For example, back when in the book of Genesis, when Joseph was in Potiphar's house, right? It says Potiphar's wife, uh, she, she started lusting after Joseph, and the Bible uses the, ter the phrase, she cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, lie with me. The Bible says she cast her eyes upon Joseph. Well, if you're going to take that literally, then, then you have to believe what she did was she ripped her eyeballs out and threw them at him and said, lie with me. <laughs> That's not what happened. <laughs> it's a figure of speech, right? So it's possible, it's at least a possibility that maybe this verse is a figure of speech, okay? God said that he would remember his covenant with Abraham for a thousand generations. So does that mean that he breaks his covenant? at that point, right? No, well, no. The covenant with Abraham is called an everlasting covenant, meaning it will never be broken. Okay? So, a thousand generations, does that imply that it doesn't continue after that into the thousandth and oneth generation? I mean, what are we talking about here? If it's everlasting, then why say that it would be kept for a thousand generations? If it's everlasting. Well, because a thousand generations is a figure of speech that is indicative or implies forever, implies eternity. If you tell your wife, I love you to the moon, you're expressing your immeasurable love for her. You're not saying that I love you to the extent of the moon, but no farther than that. It's not like you're saying, you know, babe, I love you to the moon, but Jupiter, I mean... That's asking a little much, don't you think? <laughs> I 
right? That's not, you're not being literal. It's a figure of speech. Uh, if you said, I would walk a thousand miles just to be with you. You're not setting a limit saying that you would not walk 1,001 miles because that's ridiculous. That's not what you're doing. These are figures of speech and they're, meant to ex they're not meant to express limits. They're meant to express limitlessness, you see? And I think that it makes more sense and it's consistent with the other scriptures to say that God is expressing the limitlessness of his covenant. Um, some Jew somewhere is not supposed to read this and think, what? You know, God lied to Abraham. Uh, he told Abraham in Genesis that it would be an everlasting covenant, but then later on in the book of Psalms, he changed it to a thousand generations. You know, what did he do? Did he change his covenant when Abra after Abraham was dead? No. Was God like, man, I, I said an everlasting covenant, but now that I think about it, that's actually, that's a little crazy. That's too long. I'm going to limit that to a thousand generations. No, no, no. <laughs> is a figure of speech. A thousand generations is meant to convey the idea of everlastingness, okay? No one can mentally fathom a thousand generations. It's a figure of speech expressing forever, which is exactly what the verse says or implies. Look at the verse again. Verse 8, Psalms 105. He hath remembered his covenant, quote, forever the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. In other words, you have what we call a tautology. The verse expresses the same concept in two different ways. It says it one way, and then it says the same exact thing, but with different wording. You see that? The word that he commanded is the covenant. And he's remembered it forever. And then he, in, in the tautology, in the repeat, he says to a thousand generations, meaning a thousand generations is indicative of forever. It's a figure of speech. All right. So with that in mind, let's come back to our factor of 100. We're wrapping up. I know I'm saying I'm going to go less time, but it's harder than you think. All right. So the day of Christ, we have 10 years, the day of Christ and then 10 years. All right. And then we times that by 100, a factor of 100. And the next time period is a thousand years, the day of the Lord. And then we do another factor of 100, and that gives us 100 thousand years. So, question, is the day of God connected with the number, the specific number, 100,000? 100,000. Well, we don't necessarily have a verse in the Bible that says anything about 100,000 years, but we do have that verse in Psalms 105 that associates forever, that associates eternity, that associates the day of God with a thousand generations. Remember? Because this is forever. And that psalm there in Psalms 105 verse 8, a synonymous term for forever is a thousand generations. So now we have a number to work with. How long would a generation have to be if you had to fit 1,000 generations into the number that we're looking for, 100,000 years? Well, you would have to have a generation being one hundred years. You'd have to have, if you're going to have a thousand generations, then you would have to have a, a generation being a hundred years. Every hundred years is another generation. And that would give you that number of one hundred thousand years, which we're just kind of speculating. We're just playing around with some numbers, seeing if that fits. So you'd have to have a generation being a hundred years. Now I know that sounds weird. You're thinking, a generation isn't a hundred years? That's ridiculous. Or is it? Or is it? Look at that verse there in Psalms 105 again. Psalms 105 verse 6. The context is this covenant. And it's for a thousand generations, but look at who the covenant was made with. O ye seed of Abraham his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac. How old was Abraham 
when he had his first generation? How old was Abraham when he had his first uh, son of promise? His son Isaac. Not counting Ishmael, because he was not of the promise. But as far as the promise was concerned, the promised seed that God had promised to Abraham, how old was Abraham when he had his first generation? Well, Genesis chapter 21, verse 5. And Abraham was an hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. Abraham was exactly 100 years old when he had his first generation. When God wanted to express the foreverness of his covenant, he said it would last for a thousand generations. Right? Figure of speech. His covenant was to Abraham. And if you were Abraham, a generation in your mind and a generation in the context of Abraham is 100 years. That's a generation. Therefore, a thousand generations, Psalms 105 verse 8, a generation being a hundred years, would give you a hundred thousand years. The day of God, eternity, so to speak, if you're just to slap a number on it, biblically, a hundred thousand years, you can't even fathom it, and I'm not saying that it ends after a hundred thousand years, it doesn't, but it's just, it, it depicts eternity. But the number associated with that would be a hundred thousand years. Day of God, followed by a hundred thousand years. The day of the Lord, followed by a thousand years. The factor of a hundred. The day of Christ, the rapture, followed by seven years. Oh, wait. Ten years. <laughs> Ten years. I hope this study has been a blessing, and I hope it's given you a greater appreciation for the Word of God and for the awesomeness of this book and for the awesomeness of the author of this book. God bless you. Have a good week.